Hi everyone and welcome back to Microbiology. Um, for this session we're going to go over the first part of Chapter 5. So for Chapter 5 we're basically talking about metabolism and a lot of times when we think of metabolism we only think of one end of metabolism and that is the breakdown portion of it. But what metabolism really stands for is the sum total of all of these chemical reactions that are happening where your body not only or in the case of the microbiology, in microbiology the microbes organism isn't just breaking things down but also building things back up. So the breakdown portion of it, so those things that the micro can consume for energy like glucose or maltose or um, sucrose or whatever it may be for its energetic source, that part we call catabolism. Um, that's the breaking down portion of it. That's where we're built, breaking down, um, it providing the energy. We break down the, the macromolecule, the protein of the lipid, of the um, uh, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates um, that took the catabolic properly. And anabolism is the building up end of it. So that's the other side of metabolism. So this is taking those things that you've broken down glucose, or I'm sorry, uh, carbohydrates are made out of glucose, you break them down into those building blocks of glucose, and then you turn it into a different carbohydrate. So anabolism is the building up portion, and catabolic properties are the breakdown aspect, and then you're also going to get energy out of catabolism. So this is just a nice little picture that kind of shows that, that there is this whole breaking down and building up portion of metabolism when we refer to it, and that in the release of energy, and it says it here, catabolism releases energy by the oxidation of molecules, and we'll talk about what this word oxidation means in a little bit. But when glucose is broken down, you get these byproducts, but you're also going to get energy in the form of ATP. So when we refer to energy in microbiology, we're always going to be referring to it in the form of ATP. And that's not just true for microbiology, but that's true for any of your other biology classes. So I'm sure this isn't the first time that you've seen this. Now that same energy that we made, we can use it for a plethora of things within the cell. We can use it to build proteins from amino acids. We can use it to build portions of the cell wall, to build the flagella. Um, whatever it is we need to build up in the, the microbe, we can use that energy for that. Now, any of these reactions that we're talking about for metabolism to take place, um, they could happen on their own, but it would take such a long time for this process to happen that life as we know it would be unsustainable. So that's where we have enzymes come in. We've talked a lot about enzymes in the previous lectures and also in lab class, and anything that generally ends in ASE is for the most part probably an enzyme. And the way that enzymes work is that they lower the amount of energy that's required to get a reaction to start. So even though the reaction of breaking molecules apart or putting them together, whether it's a catabolic property or an anabolic property, even though that can probably happen on its own in time, it would just take so long for it to, to take place, for it to do it. So what enzymes will do is that they will orient the two molecules in such a way that they go together without using as much energy or they break apart without using as much energy. So this graph here is really just a graphical representation of that whole discussion that we just had. So we have our reactants A and B and we want to break them down. We want to use catabolism to break them down. In order to break them down, um, if we didn't have an enzyme available, we'd have to use much more energy um, than if we did have an enzyme available. So the reaction without the enzyme is requiring more energy than the reaction is without the enzyme. So what an enzyme will do is it lowers the activation energy or the energy required to get this process started. So there are different components of what we call a hollow enzyme. Um, you have the apple enzyme, which is the protein portion of it, and then you have the cofactor. Now the cofactor is equally important because the molecule that needs to be broken down that we're going to henceforth call the substrate, either the molecule to be broken down or to be built up. So I guess the more appropriate way to say that is the molecule to be worked on by the enzyme. Um, it doesn't fit into the special site where the magic can happen, the active site, without the help of this coenzyme fitting in there as well. So the two portions of a hollow or a whole enzyme would be the protein portion, the apple enzyme, and the cofactor. And remember that molecule that's getting worked on by the enzyme either to be broken down or to be built up, because we have enzymes that can do both, um, it's called our substrate. So the way that we have this 
uh, enzymatic activity happening that our substrate will bind to the active site. And then we have this enzyme substrate complex. And then it's, since this is an enzyme that's going to break things down, then we're left with two uniquely different products. Things I want you to make note of is that the substrate must bind to the active site for the magic to happen. So within that enzyme, there are going to be special stress on the bonds or special chemicals or some sort of microenvironment that allows these two molecules to be pulled apart from one another. So first thing to note is that it has to bind to this active site. Nowhere else but on the active site. Second thing is to note that the substrate leaves this uh, this enzymatic activity differently, but the enzyme will stay the same. So the enzyme is structurally and biochemically going to remain the same after it's worked upon its substrate. So a couple of ways that we can classify enzymes are a few class classifications of enzymes. Keep in mind that none of these are exhaustive classifications. There are many more others. Um, we're just not going to refer to them um, outside of uh, what we have listed here. Um, notice how they all end in ASE, or ACE. Oxoreductase enzymes are needed in oxidase reduction reactions. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in this session, um, what an oxidation and a reduction um, entail. We have transferase, which are transfer different functional groups. So like a sulfur is a functional group. Carbonyl, carboxyl are functional groups. Um, hydroxyl functional groups, there's six of those. So any of those functional groups, and that's going to change the um, molecular structure of any molecules, which completely change the molecule. Hydrolases, which are needed for hydrolysis, which is the addition of water um, to help break things down. Lyases are the removal of atoms without hydrolysis. Isomerase is the, are enzymes that will help rearrange um, different molecules and rearrange the structure of the molecules. And by rearranging that structure of the molecule, um, it gives it a, a different chemical. And lyases are going to join molecules together. And lyases will always primarily use ATP as the mechanism for helping to build these bonds to join these molecules together. So although we notice that in an enzymatic reaction, the only thing that changes from that reaction are the substrates, the thing that's being worked upon by the enzyme. But there are some things that can influence enzymatic activity and that can influence how an enzyme works, how well it works. And those things are temperature, pH, substrate comp concentration, and inhibitors. These first two, temperature and pH, if the temperature is not quite right for the enzyme, or the pH is either too acidic or too neutral or too basic for the enzyme, then it will cause the enzyme to denature. And what denaturation means is that if the enzyme loses its shape and it loses its shape, it also loses its function because the active site will no longer be readily available for the substrates to bind to in order for this enzymatic activity or action to take place. So here we have a nice functional protein. We have our alpha helices and our beta sheets and um, that we have making this uh, three-dimensional sort of a molecule. And then here we have the same enzyme that's denatured. So it's lost its form. So if this is supposed to be the active site, can we figure out where the active site is on this guy? No, we can't figure it out. So there's really no appropriate place for the substrate to bind. And if the substrate can't bind, then that substrate can either be broken down or it can't be built up. It can't have any action that happens on it. So the enzyme can't do its job of lowering the activation energy because there's no, no place, no active site readily available. So if the enzyme loses its form, it's also going to lose its function. And changes in temperature and changes in pH will allow that to happen. So other things that can influence enzymatic activity are, so if we're looking here at temperature, um, this is just for a hypothetical enzyme. And keep in mind that not all enzymes require the same temperature or the same pH, but for this particular enzyme, it looks like the optimal enzymatic activity is about 37 degrees Celsius here. Anything lower than that or anything higher than that will keep the enzyme from working properly. For pH, for this particular pH, uh, enzyme, it looks like the pH works best at about 5. Anything higher than that or anything much lower than that is going to also keep the enzyme from working properly. Excuse me. The rate of enzymatic activity has significantly lowered, has been lowered at either end of this curve. And then for substrate concentration, the more substrate or the more thing to be 
worked on by the enzyme that you throw in to a point, the more enzymatic activity will get. But then what happens is that the enzyme is only able to work so quickly. So it's not going to be able to break down the substrates as quickly as it did before. And at some point, it becomes saturated so that it levels out. And the amount of work or activity that can be done by the enzyme, no matter how much substrate you throw into it, is going to be limited. It's kind of like a, there's an I Love Lucy episode where her and Ethel are working at like a chocolate or a cupcake factory or something. And at first, they're really on a nice little steam roll, and they're putting things in the packages. And then the packages start coming faster and faster. And at some point, they can keep up with it. But then at some point, they kind of just level out on how much they can actually get done and just makes a big old mess. So you can kind of think about that of an oversaturated enzyme that when there's too much of this substrate, there's really just not a whole lot that can be, um, the enzyme can continue to do because it can only operate and work so quickly. And then the final thing that we had is something that could affect enzymatic activity were inhibitors. We have two classes of them, competitive and non-competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors are going to bind to part of the active site, and it's going to keep the enzyme from fitting into the active site. If the enzyme can't fit into the active site, then the enzyme can't be worked upon. So this competitive inhibitor has literally outcompeted the substrate for the active site on the enzyme. Um, examples of competitive inhibition in reference to microbiology um, are the drug sulfonamide um, and PABA. Um, PABA and uh, sulfonamide, if you look at them, they both have the same um, structure, if you will. The molecular formula for them are different. There's a sulfur in this guy, and there's not a sulfur in here. Um, and there's a hydroxyl group, and there's no hydroxyl group over here. But for a lot of places, we see that there is a very, the structure is very similar. So as a result, the sulfonamides can work um, as drugs by acting as competitive inhibitors and keeping the microorganism from being able to utilize um, PABA um, because uh, the sulfonamides are taking the place. So there's no enzymatic activity that can happen on this molecule because it's all happening on this one, uh, the drug, our drug of choice. So for non-competitive inhibition, instead of the competitive, uh, the inhibitor um, outcompeting the substrate for the active site, it's going to bind at a location outside of the active site that we call the allosteric location or allosteric site. So when the non-competitive inhibitor binds to that site, it causes the active site of the enzyme to lose its shape so that there's no place for the substrate to bind. So unlike competitive inhibition, these inhibitors aren't, are not going to bind to the active site. They will, however, or change the shape of the active site by um, binding to another location, and it chemically causes the enzyme to change its shape ever so slightly to keep from the substrate from binding to it. Now, you're probably wondering why on earth, aside from having, you know, the uses in drugs, will we ever have these um, competitive and non-competitive inhibition? Well, what this, these competitors do is they help to regulate enzymatic activity, and it also helps to save energy for the cell. So in this a slide that we're looking at here, we have our substrate that gets broken down, um, and then you have these intermediates and you have your end product. Now, at some point, we have enough of this end product that we don't need to continue to make it. So it's kind of energetically wasteful to continue to make this product if we don't really need it, per se. So what happens is now this byproduct will bind to the allosteric side of the enzyme and shut this whole pathway down. Because we already have enough of the product made, we don't need the enzyme to continuously work on it and spend energy to make more of it when we've already got enough available. This is an idea and a concept that we will come back to um, in, the, in the next couple of chapters. So in like chapter 7 and chapter 8, we'll talk about this um, feedback regulation or feedback inhibition. So ribozymes are um, RNA that cuts and splices, um, or enzymes that cut and splice the RNA. So they're a special class of enzymes. And the only thing they'll work on is RNA. All right, so for the next portion of our discussion, we're going to talk about oxidation and reduction. Just as important as enzymatic activity is to metabolism, so is this understanding of oxidation and reduction.
oxidation and reduction reactions are always coupled together because one is going to require the loss of electrons and in organic molecules, usually hydrogens as well, and the other is going to require the addition of hydrogens and electrons or, or adding on. And a good way to remember that is with the mnemonic device of oil rig where if something is being oxidized, oxidation, and I'm not going to write the whole thing down because I'm going to lose space, is loss, loss of who or what, electrons and hydrogens, and reduction is gained. Gain of who or what? Electrons and hydrogens. So when we look at this picture that we have here, we have this um, Molecule A has this enzyme, or this electron, and it's going to lose it to molecule B. So as a result, A has been oxidized. Because B picked up this negatively charged entity, it's now said to have been reduced. Now at first blush, it seems like, well, how on earth would reduction be reduced? Well, look at what charge this electron carries. It carries a negative charge. So we are adding something negative. So the charge of molecule B is that it's gone back some. It's become negative because we added this negative electron to it. So good mnemonic device to remember. I'm going to star that or put a sunshine by it because it's important. Oxidation is a loss of electrons um, or hydrogens, and reduction is a gain. So here we have this oxidation and reduction represented for biological um, or organic substances. We have this organic molecule here that has hydrogens and electrons, and when it loses it, this molecule has been oxidized. NAD, which is now, it's a coenzyme that we're going to talk about at length throughout this chapter, it picks up those hydrogens and electrons, so we say that he has been reduced. NADH is an excellent electron carrier, and we're going to talk about exactly where NADH carries those electrons to, and how this process of oxidation and reduction happens in these various stages of cellular respiration or aerobic metabolism. So in the generation of ATP, we just kind of generically talked about in the beginning that said, you know, um, we have catabolic reactions that will break bonds and allow for us to make energy um, and we get building blocks out of it. And then for anabolic reactions, we're going to build, excuse me, we're going to build things up with the use of energy. And the generation of ATP comes from adenosine diphosphate um, and an inorganic phosphate. Notice that we don't have a straight line that represents this bond between the phosphates, and that's because it's a very tenuous, stressful bond. They're, all the phosphates have PO4 minus as their their formula, their chemical formula. So they're negatively charged. PO4 minus negatively charged. What do we know about like charges? Do they tend to attract or do they tend to repel? They tend to repel. So these phosphate groups are kind of tenuously um, bound there together because they have the tendency to want to um, break apart from one another. So once we smash that other phosphate group on there, we use a term for that process called phosphorylation. So there are a couple of different ways that we can get the energy that's required to smash this third phosphate onto adenosine diphosphate to make this very the highly energy charged molecule of ATP. The first type of phosphorylation that we're going to talk about is, drum roll please, substrate level phosphorylation. Now just looking at that title, substrate level phosphorylation, we already know phosphorylation means that we're going to add a phosphate group to ADP to make ATP, and then we already talked about this term of a substrate. Where do we use this term substrate before today? when we were talking about enzymes. So in your minds already, you probably are already thinking that, okay, we're probably going to have to use an enzyme for this particular type of phosphorylation to take place. And if that's what you thought, then you'd be absolutely correct. So we have the energy from the transfer of phosphate to ADP to generate ATP with the use of an enzyme. So this particular molecule has the phosphate group, and we're going to break that bond using an enzyme to put the inorganic phosphate onto ADP to turn it into ATP on this side of the formula. Notice that our carbons here are now just going to be linked together and they just don't have that phosphate. 
Second form of phosphorylation that we're going to have is called oxidative phosphorylation. Now, oxidative phosphorylation, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I guess it's not really a secret. It's probably one of my favorite topics to discuss in all of biology because it's just absolutely fascinating. It's a series of chemical reactions where we transfer elections from one molecule to another molecule, and then it generates the, the energy that's needed to um, pump the, the uh, electrons out on one end and then or the hydrogens out on one end of the membrane to come back into the other, and it makes ATP. So it's a kind of an involved process, and we're going to talk at length about what happens in this involved process probably in our next session when we get to um, the final stage of aerobic metabolism um, for oxidative phosphorylation. But for now, just understand what's on this bolded point. Energy is released from the transfer of electrons from one compound to the next for oxidation and then reduction, and then that energy is used in the electron transport chain um, in order to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. Exactly how that takes place? Oh, I know you're on the edge of your seats for this one. We'll, we'll soon see. We'll talk about that soon. And then our final way of phosphorylating is uh, photophosphorylation. Photo means light. We know phosphorylation means adding on a phosphate group to something. We're primarily concerned with adding a phosphate group onto ADP to turn it into this energy currency of the cell called ATP. So in photophosphorylation, we're going to use light. Um, to cause the chlorophyll to give up electrons. That energy released from the transfer of electrons or that oxidation through a system of carrier molecules is then used to generate ATP. Photophosphorylation is very similar to oxidative phosphorylation. They have a lot of um, key elements that are the same. And much as, as we talked about for uh, phosphor, um, oxidative phosphorylation, that there's a, an entire lengthy discussion that we will have about that probably in our next session. The same thing with photophosphorylation. Towards the end of the chapter, we'll talk about photosynthesis and how this photophosphorylation specifically or exactly takes place. So a little bit of a precursor on that is just notice that electrons are energized by light and we get ATP out of this. Um, ways that this is similar to oxidative phosphorylation or the use of an electron transport chain. All right. So now that we've talked about some pretty important um, background information on what we need to have um, in metabolism, what is metabolism, what is catabolism, what is anabolism, what's the role of ATP, what are the role of the enzymes, um, what is phosphorylation, what are the different ways that we can phosphorylate something. Now we're ready to start talking about how exactly these bacteria can utilize these strategies in order to get energy out of the macromolecules. So those carbohydrates, those proteins, those lipids, how can they get energy out of it? So the first one that we're going to talk about is an oldie but goodie, something that you're probably very familiar with, and that's carbohydrate catabolism. This is a process where we break down carbohydrates to release energy using these three very important steps that I'm sure this isn't the first time you've seen. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. So before we start to talk about those three strategies, keep in mind that not all organisms are going to use respiration, either um, um, uh, aerobic or anaerobic respiration. They might just use fermentation. And we've seen that in lab, that there are some organisms that use fermentation. If the organism does use aerobic or anaerobic respiration, we follow this path. We go through glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. And then if it follows a fermentation path, we really just go through glycolysis. And then we have these fermentation end products that we've been able to test out for in the lab. Remember those, those sugar tubes we looked at, that they were yellow, they produced acid. That if there was a gas in that little tiny tube, that Dunham tube on the inside, then that meant there was a gas that was produced. So the first one that we're going to look at is that we're going to look at these different types of respiration through glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. So I'm not going to do a whole lot more talking here. I'm going to give you all the opportunity to kind of look at what you see, because we're going to come back to this road map again, and then we're also going to talk about each one of these steps at length by themselves.
All right, so for our very first step of glycolysis, also called the Inveden Meyer Meyerhof Hoff pathway, um, is glycolysis. Glycolysis literally means sugar breakdown. So we're going to start off with a six carbon sugar. Now don't let this page, this slide, intimidate you because we're going to break down exactly what's happening when we're talking about here. First and foremost, glycolysis means a breakdown of sugar. We're talking about catabolism, so we should get energy out of it. So that's the first part of it that we should understand. Glucose it's going to get broken down. We're going to get energy out of it. The next thing I want you to understand is that glycolysis happens in two stages. You have your investment stage, everything that's above this gray line, and then you have your payoff stage, everything that's below that gray line. Now, with any good investment, you've probably heard this old adage, it takes money to make money. So um, this is where we're going to initially invest energy boom and boom into this process of making energy. Now in your payoff phase for any good investment, you want to make more than you actually invested in, right? So you don't want to just break even. I mean, it's good to break even, and you don't want to go for a loss, which is bad. But you do, in a perfect scenario, you'd like to make more than you've actually invested. And that's what happens in your payoff phase. So. In our investment phase, the second thing to remember, glycolysis is broken down into two parts, an investment phase and a payoff phase. In that investment phase, we are going to invest two molecules of ATP to get this whole party started. When we invest those two molecules of ATP, this glucose then becomes phosphorylated into glucose 6-phosphate. Notice that we popped a phosphate group onto that 6 um, glucose molecule, that six, or, I'm sorry, that six uh, carbon stack there. And then we'll rearrange it using enzymes and turn it into fructose 6-phosphate, add another ATP, so this glucose fructose 6-phosphate has now been phosphorylated into fructose 1,6-diphosphate. Now all of these intermediate names that I'm saying, you don't need to know, but I'm just giving you all this information so you understand what is happening in this uh, investment phase. So then we're going to have our fructose 1,6-diphosphate broken down into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. What happens to this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to happen to this glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. They don't show it down here because we're just going to double the number. So it's just easier to double the numbers than it is to uh, uh, just write it all over again. So what happens in the payoff phase now, so now we're ready to get our payoff. We have this electron carrier, NAD+, two of those in fact, that are going to come into this process and carry electrons to turn them into NADH. Every NADH that you see is going to go directly to the electron transport chain. Do not pass go, do not stop to collect $100, go straight to the electron transport chain, which is the last stage in this process. Um, then we now have 1,3-diphosphoglyceric um, acid. Then we have two more ADP, or two ADP come into this process, and we're going to take one of those phosphates out, and through substrate level phosphorylation, we're going to make two ATP. So already we've made our initial investment back, so we've made two ATP. Um, then as we continue to move along here, we have enzymes that are changing the structural um, the, structural, uh, the structure of this compound, and it goes from being 3-phosphoglyceric acid to 2-phosphoglyceric acid because that's where the phosphate group is attached to. Um, and then we have water that we lose out of this process. It becomes phosphophenol pyruvic acid. Now, I'm going to pause for a second. If there seems like there are holes in this story, that's because there are. We're not talking about all the enzymes that are required to catalyze this reaction, and we're definitely not going over all of the steps of glycolysis. We're, we're hitting um, just a few key steps, but we're missing some of them. So if it seems like there are holes in this story, that's because there are. We're not giving you every single thing because it could be kind of overwhelming. So. Um, what happens here is we have two more ADP that come into the equation, and we have two ATP that come out of it. So at the end of glycolysis, there are three things that I want you to remember that come out of this, and in fact, they're so important, I'm going to highlight them. We're going to have two NADHs come out. Those go straight to the ETC, the electron transport chain. Then we have two, four, four total ATP come out of this. But remember, 
we can't keep all four of these because we have to pay back our initial investment, right? So really, our net gain isn't four, it's going to be two because we have to pay back the initial investment. And then the third thing that we have come out of this are two molecules of pyruvic acid. These two molecules of pyruvic acid in respiration are going to go to the next step, which is the Krebs cycle. So here is glycolysis that we just saw on the previous page. We have glucose plus the investment of our two ATPs with two more ADP coming in in the payoff phase plus two of these inorganic phosphate phase and two of these NAD plus that we're going to allow to become reduced by gaining those hydrogens and electrons through this process. This payoff or the investment phase of glycolysis will give us our two molecules trying to find my son here, two molecules of pyruvic acid are four ATP, and remember, do we get to keep all four of these? Nope, we have to pay back our investment, so a net gain of two ATP, two NADHs, and then we have these inorganic, or these hydrogen ions, but these entities here are what I want you to remember. Now, there are some bacteria that can use glycolysis in combination with these alternatives, or they don't have to use glycolysis at all. So the pentose phosphate pathway is one of those alternative glycolysis that operates along with glucose. With this pathway, you're going to get an additional ATP. So you only get one ATP out of it, but it's in addition to what you made, those two that you made from glycolysis, because it operates um, simultaneously with glycolysis. What this pathway does is it uses pentoses, or five carbon sugars, as opposed to glucose, which is a six carbon sugar. And it will use those pentoses to make things that are five carbon sugar or contain a pentose molecule, um, such as nucleic acids. Um, it can also use it to make glucose and some amino acids as well as NADPH. The interduridor pathway is going to produce NADPH and one ATP. Um, this pathway does not involve glycolysis. It's kind of a, a way around it. And we usually only see this pathway taking place in gram-negative organisms. So Pseudomonas, Artobacterium, Rhizobium, um, those are really the only, you know, those are examples of organisms that we'd see this interduridor pathway take place in. So glycolysis is the first step of cellular respiration. It's kind of what we're talking about here. And we can be aerobic or we can be anaerobic. And we've talked about that in Chapter 6 on how there are different oxygen requirements for different bacteria. The oxidation of these molecules is going to free or liberate the electrons that can be used in the electron transport chain. And we've already talked about one carrier that's made in glycolysis, those two NADH molecules that will go to the electron transport chain to facilitate this process of uh, oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP. So there are three stages in that. First stage glycolysis, and then the next stage that we'll discuss is going to be the Krebs cycle. So before we get into the Krebs cycle, we have an immediate, immediate intermediate step, or a prep step, that Remember those two molecules of pyruvate we got from the end of glycolysis? Well, we're going to take those two molecules of pyruvate, and we have to groom them, if you will, so they can go into the Krebs cycle. So the first thing that we have to do is that we have to um, oxidize them. And remember, what is oxidation? Are we losing electrons or gaining the electrons and hydrogens? oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Loss of who or what? Hydrogens and electrons. So we're going to have to lose hydrogens and electrons from that pyruvic acid, and we're also going to have to lose our carboxyl group on here. So that is our grooming of this pyruvic acid in order to get it into um, the Krebs cycle. So first step of the oxidation of the Krebs cycle, um, or the oxidation of pyruvic, is that we take off um, a CO2 molecule. Um, we get rid of that, and by getting rid of that, we are also going to have a hydrogen that's going to be floating around, and NAD will pick up that hydrogen. So we'll pick up that hydrogen and take it to the electron transport chain. Every time you see NADH or FADH2, their next stop is to drop off those hydrogens and electrons at the electron transport chain. Since we've lost carbon dioxide, since it was a three-carbon sugar pyruvate, we've lost a C and an O and some H's, so now we just have a two-carbon sugar, and we call that 
new car two carbon sugar and acetyl groups. So acetyl, um, acetic acid is what we have there. Now this acetyl group still can't make its way into the Krebs cycle. It has to further um, have a chauffeur or an escort to get it into the Krebs cycle. And that's where we have coenzyme A. Coenzyme A acts as an escort to get this um, acetyl group into the Krebs cycle. So now it's called acetyl coenzyme A that officially goes into the Krebs. And you've probably learned that Krebs referred to as the citric acid cycle or um, let's see, what else could you have called it? So we called it the citric acid cycle in some textbooks. Um, we call it the Krebs cycle here. Um, but th those, those terms are synonymous with one another. And then our final stage of um, this uh, process of uh, respiration is the electron transport chain. At this point, all of the hydrogens and electrons that were carried by all those NADHs and FADH2s, they're going to drop off their um, hydrogens and they're going to drop off their electrons at the electron transport chain, which for bacteria is found along the plasma membrane. And the hydrogens are going to get transferred from one proton pump to another proton pump to another proton pump till if it's aerobic respiration, oxygen is the final electron carrier. If it's not aerobic respiration, then it'll be something else. If it's the final electron carrier, it's an oxygen containing compound like a sulfate or a nitrate. Um, but at any rate, the energy that's received from transferring those electrons will be used to pump out the hydrogens. So pretty soon you have more hydrogens on the outside of the plasma membrane than you have on the inside of the plasma membrane. Those hydrogens, because of chemiosmosis, want to come in. They can't just go back in the pumps they were pumped out of, and they can't just go back through that phospholipid bilayer. They're too charged. So in order for them to get back in, they have to go through a special enzyme called ATP synthase. When they come back in through ATP synthase, it's going to phosphorylate ADP into ATP. So that is where we're going to end for this session, and we will pick up and finish the rest of this um, in our next session where we will talk about, um, I'll show you some, some graphs and some pictures of um, this process of the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain, and then we will talk about um, the differences between anaerobic respiration and aerobic respiration. We'll count up the ATP that we had made, and then we'll have the end up with a discussion of fermentation and biosynthesis. So we will finish up the remainder of this chapter in our next session. Have a great morning, noon, or night.